Good morning, and uh, thank you, Dr. Smith. And uh, I'd just like to express my appreciation for the invitation to return to Columbia. It's been a few years since I've visited, and I'm very impressed with the, uh, the changes, and I look forward to the tour at noon. Um, I'm not sure how to make it go onto the screen. Thank you. This morning I'd like to talk a little bit about a uh, very common disease, that being the disease of aortic stenosis. As a cardiac surgeon, this is something that we deal with on a daily basis because aortic stenosis is, in fact, the third most prevalent cardiovascular disease. It's exceeded in prevalence only by hypertension and coronary artery disease. It tends to be a disease that uh, increases in prevalence with age, and in fact, somewhere between 2 and 70 percent, 2 and 7 percent of the population above age 65 actually carry the diagnosis. And it is, in fact, the most common indication for heart valve replacement surgery. Now, the history of the treatment of aortic stenosis began 63 years ago in Charleston, South Carolina, in the hands of a young assistant professor, Dr. Horace Smithy, who was on the faculty at the Medical College of South Carolina. Dr. Smithy was working in the laboratory of his mentor, Dr. Edward Parker, who was an associate professor at South Carolina. And they were trying to devise an operation to relieve stenotic heart valves. And they used uh, large animals in this and began to publish extensively. And their work was widely cited and read across the country. One of the people that read one of their manuscripts was a young woman, 21 years old, in Canton, Ohio, who in fact was bedridden with cardiac cachexia from severe aortic stenosis, brought on from an, an attack of rheumatic fever. Being a very persuasive young lady, she was actually able to persuade her doctors to send her to South Carolina to visit with Dr. Smithy. So in January of 1948, she flew from Canton, Ohio to Charleston, South Carolina, where Dr. Smithy did in fact perform the first aortic valvotomy on this young woman. As reported in the New York Times, she did very well. And in fact, on post-operative day number nine, Dr. Smithy presented her in person to a regional medical meeting. Now, I've come to believe that Dr. Smithy was motivated to study this disease uh, because he, in fact, had aortic stenosis. And once he had proven by operating on this young woman that the operation could, in fact, be performed, he was able to persuade his colleagues at Johns Hopkins Hospital to perform the operation on himself. But unfortunately, he died before he could reach Baltimore later that year uh, at the age of 34 years. Now, traditionally, aortic stenosis has been considered a disease of aging, a degenerative disease, one in which, for whatever reason, typically thought to be idiopathic, calcium builds up on the leaflets of the aortic valve, causing the leaflets to stiffen and then fuse and creating the clinical entity that we refer to as aortic stenosis. But in recent, year, it, recent years, it has been identified that there are certain clinical risk factors that do seem to be associated with this disease, and these include hypertension, diabetes, renal failure, and hypercholesterolemia. We were struck that these are the same risk factors that, in fact, are associated with coronary artery disease. And recent evidence now suggests that mechanisms of inflammation are important in the genesis of coronary artery disease. Hence, we were particularly intrigued by the fact that patients that have aortic stenosis have evidence of systemic inflammation. And specific examples include increased levels of circulating C-reactive protein and increased circulating levels of soluble adhesion molecules, which are important for white blood cells to attach to tissues in order to uh, invoke disease. There's histologic evidence supporting a role for inflammation in aortic stenosis as well. The normal aortic valve is a very gossamer structure. It's simply a, a layer of collagen and elastin fibrils overlaid by a single layer of endothelial cells. And interspersed among the collagen and elastin fibrils are a population of cells which, for lack of a better term, are referred to as aortic valve interstitial cells. The disease valve, however, shows stark evidence of inflammation. There's an infiltration of white blood cells, which include 
lymphocytes, macrophages, mast cells. There's lipid deposition. Um, there is evidence of calcium formation within some of these aortic valve interstitial cells. So as we began to operate on people on a regular basis for aortic stenosis and began to use our imaginations a bit, we were struck that the gross appearance of a stenotic aortic valve did not strike us as something in which calcium just randomly deposited on the valve leaflets, but instead, provided we used our imagination, there appeared to be some sense of architecture to these calcium deposits. And in addition to that, it seemed not to us that the calcium wasn't deposited on the leaflets per se, but was actually within the leaflets. And therefore, we became interested in enough to pursue this. And with the help of some colleagues in the bioengineering department, uh, we were able to do a couple of things that, uh, that set us on our way. And let me just show you a couple of examples of this. By sectioning some of these nodules of calcification from the gross leaflets, we were given the impression that this actually looks like lamellar bone. Whether it is or not is a separate issue, but it struck us that that's kind of what it looked like. And what we found was very distinct deposits of calcium uh, phosphate crystals, if you will, that appeared to be in an organized fashion. And with, some very, uh, with the help of some very good friends uh, who could generate some micro CT imaging, which unfortunately does not present well on this slide, we, they were able to use uh, the micro CT technology to reconstruct these nodules. And in fact, it did demonstrate a three-dimensional lattice that appeared to be built by design rather than by happenstance. Electromicrographs uh, further confirmed our suspicions. We were able to find uh, using um, uh, RCP, or we found my, uh, messenger RNA evidence of um, bone forming proteins, specifically osteocalcin, osteopontin, bone sialoprotein, and alkaline phosphatase. And the micrographs themselves look very similar, not identical, but, di but similar to lamellar bone formation with distinct deposition of calcium phosphate crystals. So given this, we, were, we became um, interested in the fact that the disease entity of aortic stenosis, thought to be simply a degenerative disease, had a couple of deliberate processes involved one being inflammation, and the other being that of osteogenesis, or bone formation. And we began to hypothesize, and in fact our global hypothesis has been, that mechanisms of inflammation actually incite osteogenesis within the normal valve leaflets, which progress to form the disease of aortic stenosis. Now we focused our hypothesis on these aortic valve interstitial cells, after all, there are not a lot of other cells in the valve to deal with. And getting back to the fact that these cells could be found to contain calcium phosphate crystals in the diseased valve, we specifically hypothesized that these aortic valve interstitial cells, under the influence of inflammatory stimuli, which could become a self-perpetuating process, would actually begin to change their phenotypic behavior and instead of becoming aortic, instead of being aortic valve interstitial cells, would actually become bone forming cells or osteoblast like cells. To study this, we began to take the explanted valve leaflets, both disease valves when we would do an aortic valve replacement for aortic stenosis, and our controls being normal aortic valves taken from hearts at the time of explantation of a heart for transplant. We take the valves, we can isolate these aortic valve interstitial cells, grow them in a dish, and study intracellular mechanisms in these valves. What's interesting is the normal valves have a phenotype that's described as a myofibroblast. They have characteristics of a myocyte and a fibroblast. And what that means is they stain for certain proteins that are found in both of those two cells. They have a very uh, kind of a characteristic structure uh, the red stain here is staining a protein called alpha uh, fibrinogen and alpha actin. And um, it gives it kind of a distinct stellar appearance. Given the fact that so many mechanisms of inflammation are mediated through 
toll-like receptors, we queried whether or not these cells might actually have toll-like receptors. Now, I realize few in the room actually think about toll-like receptors very often. In brief, these are uh, phylogenetically preserved receptors that mediate the immune, the innate immune response. So they have, they've been around forever, and they continue to be very important in mediation of disease. And we focused on two of these receptors in particular, TOLAC receptor 4 and TOLAC receptor 2. Now, these are important for a couple of reasons. TOLAC receptor 4 is the one you, uh, you see frequently in, in various uh, journal articles because it mediates, it, are, it is an important mediator of gram-negative infections specifically endotoxin represented with uh, the letters LPS here. So when gram-negative bacteria secrete endotoxin, the endotoxin receptor on cells that allow it to mediate its effects is the toll-like -like receptor number four. And toll-like -like receptor number two is a receptor that mediates the effects of gram-positive bacteria. So when you get staphylococcal sepsis, the staph will bind to toll-like -like receptor number two and its effects can be mediated in cells that way. We chose those two because there have been a couple of isolated case reports suggesting that explanted valves for aortic stenosis were found to have evidence of either gram-positive or gram-negative bacteria within the valve leaflets. And, and so we, we began to, to focus in this area. And the first question we had to ask was whether or not aortic valves actually express these toll-like receptors. And in fact, they do. These are pictures of uh, aortic valve leaflets. In the green, it shows up best where you can see these fibrils of collagen and elastin. And uh, provided it shows up well, the red dots are actually toll-like receptor 2 in this stain and toll-like receptor 4 in this stain. So the leaflets themselves express these receptors. And it turns out these receptors are actually expressed on these aortic valve interstitial cells, shown in this picture. Again, the red receptors are staining the, or excuse me, the red color is staining toll-like receptor 4 in this picture, toll-like receptor 2 in this picture, and this is simply a negative control. The green stain stains the entire cytoplasm of the cell, so you can get a flavor for where the uh, receptors are distributed. When stimulated, these receptors cause a, uh, a factor inside the cytoplasm of the cell that's very important in the mediation of um, inflammatory responses called NF kappa B or nuclear factor kappa B to become phosphorylated and to transmigrate into the nucleus of the cell. And it, that's exactly what happens in here. On the control slides here, the red is staining the phosphorus, the labeled phosphorus moiety. And you can see that it's uh, distributed in the cytoplasm. It's not in the nucleus. But when these receptors are stimulated, and we stimulate it with uh, a compound called uh, proteoglycan to stimulate TLR2 and endotoxin to stimulate to uh, toll-like -like receptor 4, all the phosphate immediately goes into the nucleus of the cell. So the question was, OK, if that happens, do the cells become pro-inflammatory? And the answer is yes. Using some gene chep analysis, we've identified a, a, a long list of pro-inflammatory mediators that these cells don't make at baseline, but when stimulated, begin to make. A couple of examples are interleukin-6, the chemokine, interleukin-8. Chemokines, of course, attract white blood cells to, uh, to, the, uh, to the region of interest. This is also a chemokine. And various adhesion molecules, ICAM-1 and BCAM-1, have a pronounced increase in genetic expression when these stimulators are, when these receptors are stimulated. And this translates into increased protein production. Once the gene gets turned on, the protein is made. As an example, this is what happens with interleukin-8. Uh, there's a mark, it's, it's not generated at baseline, but once these receptors are stimulated in these cells, there's a markedly increased production. Similarly, with the adhesion molecule proteins for ICAM-1, it's not generated baseline, but when stimulated, there's a, a marked increase in this adhesion molecule. And this is interesting because, remember, patients with aortic stenosis have increased circulating levels of this molecule 
in their blood that can, that can be actively measured. Given that the cells can be made to express mediators of inflammation, we queried whether or not they might begin to be able to make markers of bone formation. Alkaline phosphatase is an important enzyme in bone formation, as you know. And in fact, activation of these cells does cause a significant increase in the production of alkaline phosphatase. These are uh, photographs of the cells grown in culture, and, and as you can see, under control circumstances. Uh, and, and by the way, the alkaline phosphatase stains blue. Um, there's very little alkaline phosphatase ex expressed. Now, it, it's not expressed even when you stimulate the control cells stimulating TLR4 or TLR2. You have to grow the cells in a solution that can contains phosphate. And, and this is an osteogenic media, abbreviated OM here. But if you add a little phosphate to the media, then stimulate the cells, there's a marked increased production in, in the enzyme alkaline phosphatase, very important for bone formation. Now, we can't make these cells grow a valve in a dish or a calcified valve in a dish, but they will be for, begin to form calcium phosphate crystals. On the upper right-hand corner is a, uh, a slide staining calcium phosphate in a diseased aortic valve from aortic stenosis that was removed at the time of surgery. And it stains red with this particular stain. Again, these are cells grown in culture. If you add a little phosphate to their diet, they begin to form some vestigial calcium phosphate crystals. But when you stimulate these toll-like receptors, they rapidly begin to form calcium phosphate crystals that will grow and grow and grow as long as the cells are growing in culture. So given these data, we, we felt encouraged that our hypothesis was, was on the right track, that in fact these aortic valve interstitial cells could be stimulated by mechanisms of inflammation, begin to change their phenotype, become pro-inflammatory, and in fact take on the behavior of bone-forming cells. And as we tried to query the mechanism of how this in fact might happen, we, we learned a lot from our colleagues in orthopedic surgery. Now, what we learned is that there are a family of proteins that are very important for the formation of skeletal bone. And these are uh, bone morphogenetic proteins, BMPs. And so this, this is a family of proteins. Uh, I believe there's 12 members of this family that uh, are used clinically. Some are used clinically to help uh, accelerate bone healing. Um, and the way they work is by binding to surface-bound receptors and causing the increase of what's called RUNX2. Now, this is a, um, a transcription factor that is felt to be essential for the formation of bone. So if you don't form RUNX2, it's thought that you cannot form bone-forming proteins and you can't make bone. Conversely, if you do make RUNX2, you're able to do this. So we, we took aortic valves, uh, and, and in fact, we found that there's a, a lot of BMP, and we focused on BMP number two, uh, and there's a lot of BMP2 in stenotic aortic valves. Shown here are, again, some slides, and this is just kind of a negative control, and this is a normal valve removed from a patient with no aortic stenosis. Um, the heart was removed at the time of transplant. And this is a stenotic valve, and the little pink dots uh, are representative of what's being stained by the BMP2 stain. Now, the intracellular transduction pathways for BMP2 are simplified in this, in this. And so there's a BMP2 receptor on the surface, and we, we uh, identified these receptors on the surface of these aortic valve interstitial cells, or we could, it could get them to express these receptors. When stimulated by BMP2, this will cause uh, a variety of intracellular f mediators to be phosphorylated and ultimately go into the nucleus of the cell and cause it to make RUNX2. And our question was, will these aortic valve interstitial cells respond to exogenous BMP2? In other words, do they have the capacity to actually respond to this particular protein, which is felt to be important in bone formation. And in fact, they do. 
you grow normal aortic valve interstitial cells and you expose them to BMP2, this bone morphogenetic protein, these cells will begin to make RUNCs2, the transcription factor that is felt to be so important for bone formation. That's great. Could they also begin to express other proteins associated with bone formation, like alkaline phosphatase? And in fact, they do. This is the alkaline, the activity of the enzyme shown up here. Um, and as you can see, by adding BMP2 in the phosphorus containing media, alkaline phosphatase uh, production, or the activity of the enzyme goes way up, and the production of the enzyme likewise is markedly increased. Now, given that these cells can become pro-inflammatory and can assume characteristics of bone-forming like cells, we wanted to see if we could link these two things now. And so we asked the question, if we stimulate mechanisms of inflammation through these toll-like receptors, would the cells in fact begin to make BMP2 and make RUNX2 and assume an osteogenic phenotypic type behavior? And in fact, they do. By stimulating TOLAC receptor 4, as an example in this slide, and using our gene chip analysis, there's a marked increase in the genetic expression of genes responsible for the formation of bone-forming proteins and other proteins associated with bone formation, such as BMP2, um, certain proteins that are found in the interstitium, and the all-important RUNX2, which is this transcription factor. Um, in the cells themselves, we see that there's a marked increase of the protein, not just the genetic expression, but the genetic expression leads to the protein expression in these cells as well. The BMP2 levels go up, the RUNX2 protein levels go up, and osteopontin, as an example of a bone-forming protein, goes up as well. Well, if our hypothesis was correct, we should be able to block this somehow, uh, specifically by blocking the BMP2 receptor. And the, our postulus is that uh, the TOLAC receptors are stimulated, BMP2 is created, it acts in an autocrine and a paracrine factor to come out and stimulate this membrane-bound receptor, leading to these downstream effects. And there's a compound uh, called Nagan that is a very specific blocker of this particular receptor. And if you add noggin, the BMP2 receptor blocker, uh, to this situation, you completely stop this chain reaction. And as an example, the, the SMAD1, which is an important intracellular transducer of information from the membrane to the nucleus, is no longer phosphorylated. And alkaline phosphatase, which is made shown by the blue, uh, blue stain here in these uh, cells grown in culture, if the BMP2 receptor is functional, the cells will make alkaline phosphatase. But if you block this receptor, this production is markedly attenuated. And so we, we, we feel that we're, we're on the right track here, that uh, these aortic valve interstitial cells can, in fact, respond to inflammatory stimuli, assume a pro-inflammatory state, generate BMP2, which is important in the mediation of this change in phenotypic behavior, and we can stop it by blocking this BMP2 receptor. The reason we think that's important is because that suggests that there may be some therapeutic track that could be implemented to either halt the disease or prevent it from starting in the beginning. Now, we need to study uh, uh, stenotic aortic valve cells, and one of the, the, the abnormal cells, once the disease is already struck. Um, and what's interesting is that histologically, the cells taken from normal aortic valves and cell, these same cell lines isolated from stenotic aortic valves look very similar. And in fact, when you grow them in a dish, they're indistinguishable. The only difference is the disease valve cells take a little longer to grow. They grow a little more slowly, but they look the same. Nonetheless, they behave very differently. 
An example is, and the, 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 the dark bars here are the disease valve cells, the open bars are the normal cells. And under control conditions, neither cell lines produce much in the way of pro-inflammatory cytokines. But when stimulated, the TLR2 and the TLR4, uh, as an example in this slide, this, this shows a marked increase in interleukin-6, which is important in the mediation of this process. It's, it's significantly higher in the cells from the disease valves. Um, and in chemokines, such as MCP1, the, the stuff that draws white blood cells into the organ. The disease valves make much higher levels of the adhesion molecules, in this case interleukin or ICAM-1. And there's a much higher activation or a much higher level of the activation of the nuclear factor kappa beta, the NF kappa B, which is so important in getting the message from the TOLAC receptor into the nucleus. This may be because these cells have much higher levels of TOLAC receptor 2 and TOLAC receptor 4, shown here on the bar graph. So the normal valves, or cells, cells from normal valves, have a certain level of TLR4. The disease valve express about twice as much. Like, and uh, this is like, I'm sorry, this is TLR2 and this is TLR4. And similarly, when stimulated, the cells from the disease valve make much higher levels of this BMP2, this bone-forming protein or bone morphogenetic protein. Now, this phenomenon is, is not specifically linked to TOLAC receptors. So another very important inflammatory mediator throughout the body is interleukin-1. This, uh, this has been implicated in a variety of diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, certain types of nephritis, certain types of colitis, and it's found in very high levels in aortic valve stenosis. Histologically, this, uh, this is a normal valve, and uh, when stained for interleukin-1, we don't see any interleukin-1. But in a stenotic valves, we consistently see substantial amounts of interleukin-1 in the valve leaflets highlighted here by these arrows. Now, the interleukin-1 is produced by white blood cells, shown in this uh, higher power. So this is staining for interleukin-1. This is inside a white blood cell. So the white blood cell comes into the valve leaflet of the disease valve, carrying or producing, once it gets there, the interleukin-1. And then the interleukin-1 can act on the cells. And when it does, it causes the production of BMP2 the protein that we think is so important in the change of behavior of these cells to become bone-forming like cells. Now, what's interesting is that there are the, the body has a very important defense mechanism to protect itself from interleukin-1. And this is called interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, or IL-1-RA. And our cells make this to fend off the actions of interleukin-1. If you don't have interleukin-1 receptor antagonists, you may get rheumatoid arthritis. You may get certain types of nephritis. You may get certain types of colitis. And what's interesting to us is that patients that have aortic stenosis, well, let me, let me back up. Patients that have, if you have a normal aortic valve, and put it that way, there's a lot of interleukin-1 receptor antagonists, the defense mechanism, found in your valve leaflets, stained and marked by these arrows. It's the little brown stain. This is a disease valve, or a section from a disease calcified valve, and there's very little, if any, of this defense mechanism in the valve. Shown graphically, under control situations, the normal valves shown in the dark column here have lots of the defense mechanism interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. There's, we can find none in all of the stenotic valves that we've studied, which is now approximately 20. What's interesting is that when the normal valves are stimulated by TOLAC receptor 4 or TOLAC receptor 2, they will make more of this defense mechanism. The normal valves try but don't seem to be able to make it. We infer from this that there, there, this may offer yet additional insight into a potential therapeutic strategy uh, to approach the treatment of aortic stenosis. And let me just finish up with uh, one final thought here. 
it's, it's interesting to note that it's only the valves on the left-hand side of the heart, the aortic and the mitral valve, that calcify. The pulmonary valve and the tricuspid valve virtually never calcify. And so we, we asked the question, well, could that possibly have anything to do with some extrinsic differences from one valve to the next? And, and we believe that, in fact, there are. Very quickly, here's a couple of examples. If we look, compare the aortic and the pulmonary valve, for instance, the pulmonary valve never calcifies. Um, it turns out that the aortic valve, as we've, as we've shown, has lots of toll-like receptors, in this case, toll-like receptor 2, and the pulmonary valve has some but much less expression of toll-like receptor 2 on the pulmonary valve. Uh, in the staining here, this is the aortic valve. The red stain is the toll-like receptor 2. In the pulmonary valve, there's very little of it. This trans, perhaps this is the reason, but it certainly is associated with the fact that the cells isolated from the pulmonary valve are much less pro-inflammatory. In other words, sorry, when stimulated, sorry, the pulmonary valves will make some interleukin-8, but not nearly as much as the aortic valve cells. Likewise, the aortic valve cells, as I've shown you, will make a lot of ICAM-1, this important adhesion molecule. The pulmonary valve cells make very little of it. Getting back to this important, what we think is an important protein, the BMP2, the bone morphogenetic protein, the aortic valve, valve cells will make a lot of it. When, when toll-like receptor 2 and 4 are stimulated, the pulmonary valve cells will make very little of it above baseline. And alkaline phosphatase, an important uh, enzyme associated with bone formation, as I've shown you, the aortic valve cells, provided they've got enough phosphate in their diet, will make alkaline phosphatase. The pulmonary valve cells will make very little of it. And finally, the aortic valve cells that I've showed you will form calcium phosphate crystals when stimulated. The pulmonary valve cells really don't. So in summary, rather than a disease that simply is one of degeneration, one that occurs by happenstance, we actually think that aortic stenosis is an active disease process. Um, and we, we've focused, as you've seen, our efforts in, in dissecting this out on these aortic valve interstitial cells. And we actually think these are central to the pathogenesis of the disease. And in fact, these cells, when stimulated, are able to change their phenotypic behavior and behave like bone-forming cells. And perhaps the reason that we see calcification of valves on only the left side of the heart may in part be due to the fact that there are intrinsic differences in the cells of the valves on the left as opposed to the right side of the heart. Thank you very much.